Hello there. So in our last lecture, we have seen that Willen Mack Goldsmith made a very bold proposition that electron has an intrinsic angular momentum that is called electron spin angular momentum. And that explained a host of experimental observation. So here we say that now electron can have two types of angular momentum that is orbital angular momentum and spin angular momentum. And according to Bohr's model orbital angular momentum takes only integral values L and spin angular momentum now according to Uller Mangel Boltzmann takes only half. The component of this will be m of L minus L2 plus L and component of this spin angular momentum we will write S equal to minus half and plus half. So, angular momentum is a vector quantity, it is certain direction and this way or that way if the spin component is minus half or plus half. Orbital angular momentum also is a, is a vector quantity. So, this can take various components depending upon the value of this and correspondingly different directions. So, these two angular momenta which are vectors they can now be added to generate a net angular momentum and that can have various combination it can take integral values or half integral values depending on this. And let us see how this explains the various experimental observation. Last lecture I showed you the fine structure of spectrum of hydrogen atom and deuterium atom. Here 3 s and 2 p were connected by only one transition. Now this L equal to 0 for 3 s and spin s as half together can give rise to total angular momentum of j equal to half. Similarly, for 2 p state L equal to 1 and s equal to half these two or angular momentum combined together to give rise to value of j which is 3 by 2 and half. So, these two now can have energy level which is shown on the right hand side. So, earlier 3 s and 2 p are connected by one transition now because of this 2 p can have two types of total angular momentum j equal to 3 by 2 and j equal to half. Now, I have two transitions. So, these two transitions are actually the what is seen in the spectrum given by deuterium and hydrogen. So, these are the fine structure and how easily this can be explained with the introduction of this another angular momentum s which takes value of half. The Zimon effect, the splitting of spectral lines in the presence of magnetic field also can be now very easily explained by this two possible orientation of the magnetic moment in the magnetic field. The same is true in the case of the stern Gerlach experiment where the silver atom split into two. Now, its origin is again the same that spin angular momentum takes two values plus half and minus half and it gives two component of the magnetic moment and this causes the beam to split into two. So, you see how all these experimental results can be explained based on this existence of electron spin. So, electron has therefore, an intrinsic magnetic moment. So, they behave like a tiny bar magnet. So, the bar magnet has a magnetic moment given by a mu sin mu and its direction goes from south to north and this is a vector quantity. 
Now, see the origin of magnetic moment and the angular momentum that we are intimately related. The relation okay. is given by this mu z is equal to g e beta e s z, where mu z is the component of the magnetic moment vector in a given direction. G e is a proportionally constant called the g factor, beta e is Bohr magneton and S z is the component of spin angular momentum. Magnetic field, magnetic field also is a vector quantity. It shows you the direction of the magnetic field lines that starts from north pole and goes to south pole. So, this is the way it is. So, the magnetic field vector direction is given by this red arrow. So, I have a magnetic moment and a magnetic field. If I place them in a magnetic field, then what happens? They will of course, orient according to the allowed value of the angular momentum. If we take a ordinary magnet, which is this north pole and south pole, if I place in a magnetic field, let us say it is this way, north and south, then you have all of you have experienced that when north facing north and south facing north, this is not the energetically favorable system. What is favorable is that of this bigger magnet. So, this becomes the lower energy state. So, this is the state this magnet is going to take naturally, but then if I have to turn it this way then I need more energy because these two will repel. But classical magnet if you classical means the macroscopic magnet that you normally you can see that can take any possible orientation. So, I can in fact have This is also possible. So, energy of this will be somewhat intermediate between this and that. This is the least energy, this is the highest energy, this is the energy which is intermediate. The energy E is given as the scalar product of the vector B and the vector mu. So, this is of course dep dependent on the angle that this magnetic field vector makes with the magnetic moment of the magnet. So, classically any such orientation is possible, but for microscopic particle that has been now shown by Ullenberg and Goldsmith experiment uh, interpretation and the splitting of silver particles that only two orientations are possible here. So, because the angular momentum vector takes only two values spin angular momentum specifically. So, even though all these are possible classically for this microscopic magnet I only have these possibilities. This is a higher energy configuration or arrangement other one is lower energy arrangement corresponds to m s equal to minus half or m s equal to plus half. So, this is now shown in this diagram here. So, for electron spin in a magnetic field has this type of two energy levels which are characterized by the m s equal to minus half or m s equal to plus half. This is the electron Zeeman splitting. Now, you see of course, the splitting the energy difference between these two states with m s equal to plus half or m x equal to minus half is this dependent on the strength of the magnetic. It is of course, very obvious. If the strength of the field is small, the splitting will be small. If the strength is large, splitting will be large. The splitting changes linearly with the magnetic field. So, I said in the 
in the last lecture that NMR and EPR, the electron paramagnetic resonance and nuclear magnetic resonance are very similar in the, their characteristic. So, many nuclei have magnetic moment, in particular proton for example, which also has spin half system, its nuclear spin is half. On the right hand side, the energy of a proton for example, when placed in a magnetic field, the splitting is shown here corresponding m i equal to plus half and corresponding m i equal to minus half. On the left hand side, the same splitting as shown earlier is also shown that electron spin in a magnetic field splits into minus half and plus half. But the difference is in the strength of the interaction. Expressions are also very similar. For the electron spin, it is mu z equal to minus z e beta i s z. For nucleus, it is plus g n beta n i z. The difference is in the strength of their magnetic moments that is of electron and the proton that of a nucleus. So, we can write this is for electromagnetic moment. For nuclear magnetic moment, this becomes so here the difference is actually in this and this. So B is Bohr magneton and beta of n is called these are the units in terms of which the magnetic moment is measured. So, difference is in the magnitude, where does the magnitude come into, how does it appear here. So, if you write here, this is actually e a h by 4 pi mass of electron and this one similarly will be equal to mass of proton. So, you all know that mass of proton is about 2000 times heavier than mass of electron and that appears in the denominator here. So, obviously, the Bohr magnetron is about 2000 times bigger than nuclear magneton. So, that is reflected here. Typical electron magnetic moment will be 2000 times bigger than nuclear magnetic moment. Also note this sign difference here. This says that the direction of the electron spin angle momentum vector is opposite to the direction of the magnetic moment of electron. Here they are the same direction that is of course, related to the charge of these two protons have positive charge, electrons have negative charge. So, we have this difference in the sign. Now, when you keep in the magnetic field, the interest energy which is given here can be now written as in terms of the corresponding spin angular momentum and the energy level is shown here shows that they look very similar. The difference is only in terms of what spin state that low energy level correspond to. For EPR, it is the minus half state, for NMR it is the plus half state here. Now, other differences because of this difference of about 2000 in their values, the splitting of the energy level for the same magnetic field will be about 2000 times smaller than the splitting that the electron will see. So, the similarity is here, but difference also here that principle is very similar, but the magnitude of interaction is very, very different. So, for a typical magnetic field, 
there is a huge spectrometer. NMR usually appears in let us say megahertz region, which, but EPR in the similar magnetic field appear in 1000 megahertz region, which is called gigahertz. So, you can write here megahertz is 6 hertz and Thousand megahertz is called okay. this is typical in NMR. And this is typical of okay. so having obtain the splitting of energy levels now i can look at the their spectroscopy how is it done now so typical absorption spectroscopy involves shining light and seeing where exactly the light is absorbed and this spectroscopy could be let's say electronic transition horizontal transition rotational transitions the all, all almost all of this you must have come across so here this energy levels that is shown on the left hand side are actually property of the atoms or molecules. They are fixed there, See, all the energy levels are fixed. So, you cannot do very much about it. All you can do is to shine light of appropriate energy. So, the energy gap of the two levels match with the energy that goes inside. This are, say these are fixed energy levels and I sign light if the wavelength of the light matches with let us say this much then it can presumably absorb the light and I can get the absorption spectrum. Now, if the energy of the light is matching with this one then it can also cause absorption and I can get another absorption here. So, these energy levels are fixed in a conventional spectroscopy, but here you have seen that energy level and their gap depends on the external magnetic field. So, they keep changing. So, this change the magnetic field the energy level change. So, I have to have a fixed energy gap and the sign light on that. How do I fix the energy gap? The delta E that is given here is now become G beta and B, B is the external magnetic field. If B changes, the gap also changes. So, I can fix the energy gap by fixing the magnetic field and the delta I could be equal to the external radiation and then which can be now this condition becomes the condition for matching the energy gap with the radiation energy. So, this fundamental relation we call the resonance condition that is satisfied for absorption to take place. So, I write it once more here because this is going to be very fundamental to the spectroscopy. This is the incident radiation frequency and this is the magnetic field you see they are proportional. So, this again can be contrasted with the conventional spectroscopy where this energy gap is fixed. And so, we vary the frequency of the radiation to match the energy gap. Here now I have a variable energy gap which is caused by the magnetic field B. So, I can to make this equation satisfied, I can vary this or vary this. So, this we will see later how actually ex the experiment is done to look at the absorption spectrum. Anyhow, but what do you expect the about the spectrum, nature of the EPR spectrum when you do the experiment? So, this is the energy gap. So, if the delta E is fixed at a magnetic field B 0, then I need to satisfy H nu to be equal to this. So, 
the spectrum as a function of magnetic field will have this sort of behavior that I suppose I keep the frequency constant, H nu is constant. So, the energy gap is now varied by changing the magnetic field from lower to higher side. So, at this position the energy gap delta I have exactly equal to become H nu, then the absorption radiation takes place there. Nothing happens if the magnetic field is lower than B0 or higher than B0. Exactly at this condition, this equation is satisfied. So, the spectrum should look like this one up, down, and then goes up. So, there is one line here. So, this is the electron paramagnetic resonance spectrum of an isolated electron kept in the magnetic field. So, in a sense, it is very simple spectrum, just only one line. But then the simplicity shows that if there is all there to it that if you have got one electron put a magnetic field it gives one line then this is not going to be very exciting because all the substance which gives EPS spectrum will give one line spectrum and what information can we get from there very little. So, it is not going to be very exciting or informative. So, now so let us see some real experiment spectrum and how they show their EPS spectrum. This is the radical which is called para benzo semi quinone radical. I will write the structure and formula again here. If we start with this hydroquinone. This is hydroquinone and it just oxidize it in oxidize by air actually the oxygen of air it's a very simple experiment dissolve it in alcohol and make it alkaline then in the alkaline medium this will convert to should say this is an alkaline medium. So, here this OH and OH in alkaline becomes O minus and it half of that gets oxidized. So, it becomes O dot. So, we call them semiquinone and this being anion. So, we call it semiquinone. anion radical. Now, if the EPR spectrum is shown here and you see that gives 5 lines and lines have equal gap among them, but intensity is not same this follows certain pattern. We will see this thing pattern and try to figure out later why they are so, but it shows that this single unpaired electron which is present here they are not giving single line EPR spectrum, but 5 lines are coming. So, something more is happening, something more than what was sort of discussed and we expected to happen. Before we go to another example, here is a little digression. The EPS spectrum that you saw there is in the form of a derivative. In the previous experience of various types of spectroscopy that we have seen, the absorption spectrum will always look like this type of thing. So, intensity of light is absorbed in this fashion as a function of of course, as a function of wavelength or frequency. Here we are plotting the spectrum as a function of magnetic field, but it is equivalently that we are doing the experiment that we are looking at the supposed to get absorption spectrum of this kind. Instead it shows derivative spectrum. So, why it is so is something again we will see later. So, we just right now take it from me that actually this absorption spectrum of this is of this kind that 5 line absorption line come and they are exactly equivalent 
to this one. So, what the spectrometer records is the derivative line, but internally the absorption spectrum is this. So, why the spectrometer gives the output in the form of a derivative is something we will take up shortly. Okay. Another example, the same semi you know here if we start with you know instead of this if we start with this tertiary butyl group here then this becomes tertiary butyl group there. So, we call it this is the 2 5 these are the two groups. So, we call it 2 5 di tertiary butyl and ion radical. The EPR spectrum of this is shown here and it gives only 3 lines. It is the same type of radical earlier gave 5 lines now it is giving 3 lines. So, you see how now the EPR spectrum is becoming interesting that it is something it is now giving information about the structure of the radical. So, it is useful. We take some more example. Here this is another radical the radical is called tempol as a short form, but the structure is shown here. It is a piperidin group with 4 methyl groups attached to that and this N O here the O has one unpaired electron that unpaired electron give rise to the IPR spectrum and the spectrum is shown here it gives 3 lines of equal intensity now and the gap is same. So, mind you that here the nitrogen nuclear spin is 1 nitrogen 14 nucleus we will see that that has something to do with these 3 lines which are appearing there. I said in the introduction that EPS spectroscopy is very useful for characterizing transition metal complexes. So, here is an example of copper complex this is called copper diethyl diethyl carbamate and this is the chemical formula of this. So, this gives 4 and not quite 4 line, but you see that one group here, one here, another there, third one is there, they have got funny looking structure. This line is split here and that this line is sort of split here, but intensity seems to be quite different for different lines. So, again it shows that EPR is able to give a lot more information than what we sort of anticipated at the beginning. So, it is going to be very useful technique to get the information our electronic structure. Now, this molecule or copper complex is made of naturally occurring copper and you know that naturally occurring copper has two isotopes nuclear spin 3 by 2 for both of them, but mass number is 63 or 65. So, if one chemically purifies this isotope and have just pure 63 isotope, then this the spectrum looks like this. So, here see the simplicity now earlier we had funny looking spectrum of this structure there some structure there that has disappeared you now instead of that we got 4 lines. Though 4 lines do not seem to have same intensities nevertheless there are 4 lines of this kind and intensity is strongest on the right hand side and because smaller and smaller, but notice that width also becomes bigger and bigger as you go from right to left. But here the we have got enriched copper 63 nucleus. Okay. The another complex of vanadyl, this complex has 2 vanadyl nucleus in some complicated fashion. So, vanadyl nuclear spin happens to be 7 by 2 and here you see the whole lot of lines there 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15 lines are there and intensity as you can see quite quite unusual. It starts from 
the left hand side some sort of low intensity they become bigger and bigger and intensity increases again it goes down and down. If you look at the width carefully the width becomes narrower and narrower in the middle and then again it becomes broader it gives the shape in this fashion. Okay. So, so these lines that we see lots of lines these lines in EPS spectrum that you have shown these are called hyperfine lines. One important characteristic of the line is that they depend on the nuclear spin state. So, that is a clue to something that origin of this thing that clue is that is the copper 63 and 65 as given as to quite different spectrum. So, the, this must have something to do with the interaction of the unpaired electron with the nucleus. So, this interaction is called the electron nuclear hyperfine interaction. So, at this point let us just summarize what we have seen now that EPR spectroscopy gives lots of lines in general and they are characteristic of the nucleus that is present there. There are also characteristic of the type of radical which is giving rise to the EPR spectrum and from there therefore, we can learn a lot about the structure of the radical or structure of electronic structure of the transhumeral complexes and so what not. But most importantly now that it is the hyperfine line and the interaction of the electron with the nucleus that gives us to the hyperfine line is the key to this summary of what we have learned today.